I have a, um, an extravagant introduction to you. Um, I do see that we have some students joining. Good. Then I will, I'll give you a brief version of the extravagant yeah, introduction. Please, please so obviously we're very happy to have Professor Charles King with us. Uh, he is a professor of government and international affairs at Georgetown. He is a prolific prize-winning author. Um, his latest book about what he, which he's going to talk is Gods of the Upper Air, How a Circle of Renegade Anthropologists Reinvented Race, Sex, and Gender in the 20th Century. Uh, he was on the New York Times bestseller list with that. He won several prizes for it. And I gather that they're making a movie out of it, but maybe he'll tell us about it. Um, he, um, uh, his other books include uh, Midnight at the Para Palace, The Birth of Modern Istanbul, uh, then, uh, as I said, one of my favorite books, um, Odessa, uh, Genius and Death in the City of Dreams, uh, for which he also won uh, the National Jewish Book Award. Um, and I could go on and on. He's obviously written uh, a major book about Moldova. He's written about the Black Sea. Um, and um, he's won three, I think, teaching awards uh, from the School of Foreign Service. He's won other medals there. And as he always likes to tell us, he is a first generation college student who was a Rhodes, uh, he was, excuse me, was a Marshall Scholar um, in, uh, um, at Oxford from which he got his, no, you were a Rhodes Scholar, right? Oh, no, I was, I was the other one. I was a Marshall. No, you were the Marshall. Well, my husband was a Marshall, so yeah. <laughs> exactly. He went for Marshalls. He was a Marshall Scholar at Oxford University uh, from which he has an MPhil and a PhD and a BA from the University of Arkansas. So we are delighted um, that you uh, agreed to join us. And I guess the title of your talk today is um, How Caucasians Became White, the Eurasian Origins of American Racial Politics, please. Well, thanks so much, Angela. And I have to say um, right at the beginning, it's a thrill for me to be your last public event um, uh, we've, we've been colleagues for a long time and, um, and, and, and you have been such a, a great mentor and inspiration as a teacher and scholar and public intellectual to me. So thank you. And, um, and congratulations on your retirement. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, the subject I wanted to talk with you about, uh, today is one that I've been working on for a long time. And in fact, brought together, especially over the last couple of years, lots of different interests of mine. But at their core is this question. How is it that the things that intellectuals often couch as constructed or ephemeral, things like nationality or race or ethnicity uh, or gender, um, subjects on which there are innumerable books in libraries with the title of the form, The Construction of X. How are these things nevertheless so powerful in shaping the lives of real living human beings? Uh, there seems to be a disconnect between these two things. And so what I wanna do today is to sort of bring together a seemingly disparate set of themes from uh, Russian and Eurasian history, from the 19th and 20th century history of the United States, the history of science, um, and from very contemporary American politics to um, examine what I call the Eurasian origins of American racial politics. Because I think these connections may be to some of you um, rather surprising, to others of you, you'll be very familiar with the story I'm going to tell now. And the nice thing about our conversation this evening is that with uh, so many old friends in the audience, this is to me going to seem like a wonderful conversation around a dinner table. To you, it may seem like the guy at the dinner table who won't shut up. So I'm, like, <laughs> so I'm going to try to talk for about 30 or 40 minutes. And then hopefully we can have a more general conversation uh, uh, about some of these themes together. So let me share my screen with you because I do have illustrations for this <clears throat> and, um, and uh, it will be a kind of illustrated uh, talk. Okay, can everybody see that just fine? Yep. Okay. So if you were to go into any textbook in world history, international history, um, what would become anthropology in the early part of the 20th century, human geography, 
all of this from roughly a century ago, you would find rep representations of what were said to be the natural races of humankind. Um, here's an example of that. Um, and these illustrations always have certain qualities to them. Uh, first of all, they're almost always entirely men, um, as if if you needed to know something about race, you would only need to see the male of the species to be able to identify it appropriately. Secondly, um, there is an emphasis on skin color, skin tone, as a definition of what a race is. Third, racial characteristics seem to align, as they do in this illustration, with other characteristics, whether one wears a shirt or not, whether one wears a hat or a headdress or not, whether you know how to tie a bow tie or not, and all sorts of physical and what we might call cultural or historic feature, historical features that wrap together in a thing uh, called race. Similarly, if you, again, looked at virtually any textbook from the middle of the 20th century, even, you would be told that the basic divisions of human beings are into things called races. Now here, of course, we see the female of the species uh, represented as well, but this clustering of ideas that there is a thing called skin tone that defines a race, and here, helpfully, those colors are spelled out for an American audience, red, yellow, white, brown, black. And if you notice, if you compare this um, illustration to the previous one, you'll notice, of course, that uh, there are only five of these types, as if there is a settled idea that these, uh, that these types only come in five varieties. We also see in this illustration, of course, that there are other words, labels attached to these racial types, Indian, Mongolian, Malay, African, and right there in the middle, white or Caucasian that I'll come back to in a moment. You also see in this representation, a sense that you know where these types live, or you know the kinds of geographic environments that they come from. The red or Indian race, apparently en plein air, you know, out in the on, on the Great Plains or somewhere living under uh, the clouds and the stars. The yellow or Mongolian race, as it's depicted here, behind, um, I guess that's a in front of a, a cherry tree and and uh, with with a with a paper screen, I think, a Japanese screen behind. Um, the black or African race depicted here clearly with palm trees and some kind of uh, jungle, and then the white or Caucasian race uh, living apparently only in Manhattan and Connecticut. So these illustrations give us a sense of the world as it was presented to American students or the reading public throughout much of uh, the, the last couple of centuries. Uh, here's one that gives us a little more complicated view. We see that, at least taking this illustration seriously, we see that there are lots of subtypes, as it turns out, to each of these racial categories. The Mongolian, you can't see all of the subtypes in, in this illustration because of the small print, but the Mongolian is divided into at least 10 different subtypes here, the Caucasian into several, the Malay, American, and Ethiopian into others. Uh, the thing that also might suggest itself to you in looking at all of these illustrations is that there seem to be some confusion about how many subtypes there are, whether there are subtypes at all, or even what if there are five of them, what we're supposed to call them. And the journey I want to take you on tonight is one that leads from this confusion or this effort to figure out how many types of human beings there really are all the way to the history and politics of the 20th century. The place we have to start is with a Swedish naturalist named Carl Linnaeus, whose life spanned a good part of the 18th century, who was alive at the core in the middle of the Enlightenment um, the great upsurge in 
philosophic thought, what we would call the beginnings of the scientific um, method, the enumeration of basic rights and freedoms, this watershed event um, in European and, and global history. Linnaeus, in observing the world in the 1730s, published a book called Systema Naturae, um, the system of nature, in which he sought to categorize all living things according to the types to which they naturally belonged. And so from one's eighth grade science class, eighth grade biology class or so, where you had to memorize kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, that system of classifying the natural world is something that we owe to this one person, to Linnaeus. And over time, his categories were elaborated and subcategories created. But this idea that the natural world, the God-created world, comes in a discernible set of categories that through scientific observation and study, we can identify is an idea that Linnaeus introduces to the world and that in fact then becomes, all the way to our eighth grade science class, the natural way in which we think that um, things that we call species and subspecies and phyla and so on um, live their lives. Now, a species or a kingdom, a phylum or a class doesn't know it's a class, obviously, but Linnaeus believed that he had uncovered a basic set of laws about how nature naturally operated. Human beings being a part of nature, one of the Enlightenment's great insights that human, pe human beings don't stand apart from the natural world, but they're embedded in the natural world. For Linnaeus, this meant that human beings could also be categorized according to the same natural system that he thought obtained among animals, plants, and um, other categories of living things. And if you look into Systema Natura, you'll see that Linnaeus divides homo sapiens, as he called them, into several subtypes. Homo sapiens europaeus, that he described as white and sanguine in their outlook. Uh, they were gentle. Uh, they tended to wear tight clothing, uh, Linnaeus said. Homo sapiens americanus, red, we think he means skin color here, choleric in their um, orientation. They were stubborn, free, and they tended to paint their bodies. Homo sapiens americanus is what we would now call Native Americans. Homo sapiens asiaticus, yellow, melancholic in their outlook, greedy, and tended to wear loose clothing. Are you beginning to see the connections with those textbooks from the, uh, the middle of the 20th century. Homo sapiens africanus, black, phlegmatic. They had a flat nose and Linnaeus tells us had shameless females because in his experience in hearing, in reading the reports of travelers to Sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere, they reported that sometimes uh, women uh, in this category failed to wear top garments and were therefore shameless and exposing themselves. And then Homo sapiens monstrosus, giants, dwarfs, mythological creatures, which to Linnaeus were all part of this other subcategory of human types. So a couple of things that from the beginning of the 18th century, um, from the 1730s, um, begin to seep into the way in which Europeans conceive of the world, that human beings are part of nature, that nature comes in predetermined subtypes, either created by God or arriving in some other kind of way, and we'll come on to, come on to some of those pathways in a, in a moment, and that when you observe, when Europeans began to observe the different types of people that they had either, either read about in the traveler's tales that, uh, that filtered back to London, Paris, and elsewhere, or whom they encounter as um, local populations from, uh, from the Americas, from Africa, came to Europe and presented themselves, presented their physical difference uh, to Europeans, 
it seemed absolutely obvious that you would apply these same kinds, these, these same types. And that again, things tended to cluster together. Because of course, in observing the world, they just did. They clustered together, the type of clothing that someone wore, the skin color someone had. And then obviously from an 18th century European perspective, the level of civilization, the language, perhaps even the intelligence clustered with each of these uh, typical traits as well. We're still in a moment, however, where the categories into which people naturally fall are still kind of unsettled. You know, if you look back at Linnaeus's categories from the previous slide, you may ask yourself, well, surely people at the time, weren't they, thinking that you couldn't put skin tone and, and clothing um, in the same category that of course clothing can change and and moods can change and natural dispositions maybe can even uh, change. The person who begins to codify in a much more careful way the basic types of human beings is um, someone who was a, a generation older, a little more than a generation older than Linnaeus, named Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. An 18th, 18th and early 19th century um, German scholar who became the most well-known categorizer of human beings, um, the, one of the best known anatomists of, uh, of his time. He was the kind of person to, if you had a, um, a princely son, if you were a monarch or um, you happen to be a country squire with a rather ambitious son you wanted to have educated, you might send him to um, Blumenbach's University in Göttingen um, in what would become Germany. Uh, to study the latest scientific findings that Blumenbach was, uh, was presenting to the world. Now, at exactly this time, um, Blumenbach is benefiting from um, a vast series of collecting expeditions and travels that are happening all over, all over the world as people are beginning to explore the South Pacific as West Africa which had long been, of course, open to trade from Portugal, England, elsewhere, in particular, of course, in particular, of course, the Atlantic slave trade, and increasingly Eurasia, as, as in the Caucasus, in Central Asia, European travelers are uh, beginning yet another wave of, of exploration, modernization, just as the, as the Russian Empire is beginning its own process of further opening uh, to the rest of Europe. And the place that um, draws Blumenbach's attention is what we know as the South Caucasus, in particular, Georgia. Georgia draws his attention for a very particular reason, because the lectures that Blumenbach engages in in Göttingen, the scientific findings that he begins to report to the world, all rely on a collection of human skulls. That collection is his research database, if you like. And they come from all over. They come from, you know, when, when travelers would go to various places that they happened to dig up uh, a grave as they often did. Blumenbach had networks that would allow him to collect these things. He had friends who had assembled their own collections uh, of skulls. And this forms the basis of Blumenbach's theorizing. If you read the book that Blumenbach created from his researches. It was actually um, the dissertation he submitted for a doctorate in 1775 titled On the Natural Variety of Humankind. You find a really interesting illustration uh, of a person whom he labels the Femina Georgiana, or here in the, the, the Latin genitive, Femina Georgiana. It's the skull of a Georgian female. Blumenbach was a devolutionist, we might call him. Of course, Charles Darwin wasn't around yet. The theory of evolution wasn't around yet. Um, but Blumenbach did believe in change. The idea of change over time was not something that Darwin in the 19th century invented. Even in the 18th century, it was obvious to the naturalists of the day that the world as it appeared to us now 
is not the world as it has always been. But for Blumenbach and other naturalists of the time, the pattern of change was devolutionary, meaning that God had created perfection. If you wanted evidence of that, you only have to open uh, the Bible and consult the book of Genesis. God had created perfection. And then after the fall, once humans had knowledge of good and evil, once they were expelled from the Garden of Eden, so began a long process of falling away from that godly, divine ideal. And Blumenbach and other naturalists thought they understood something about how this worked. It was perhaps diet, it was perhaps environment, it was the influence of the sun on human skin, and a whole variety of other causal pathways that created the modern differentiated world as we see it today. And Blumenbach, using the work of Linnaeus and other naturalists, uh, began to argue that, in fact, if you study the skulls as he had done, if you looked carefully at the different types of humankind, you would see that there were, in fact, only five of them. There were Americans, as he called them, meaning people we might now call uh, Native Americans or, um, or Alaska Natives or people native to, uh, to North and South America, Ethiopians, people who might now be labeled as of African uh, descent, Malays, um, a, a category that we might now describe as Pacific Islander, Mongolians, we now often use the term Asian to describe that category, and then the one right at the top, Caucasians. Blumenbach was the first person to use this label to describe what we would now call white people. And the reason for it was the Femina Georgiana. Because Blumenbach, in studying her skull in particular, reckoned that it was about the closest thing he had seen to perfection. Uh, there were stories in his day that perhaps the Garden of Eden lay somewhere near what we now call Georgia, that somewhere in the South Caucasus, the Ur type of humanity may well have arisen. Maybe there was some biblical evidence to suggest that was true. And even if you didn't believe the textual evidence, you could believe the evidence in front of your eyes. She was beautiful, this woman. Look at her skull, how beautifully proportioned it is. Um, how the jawline suggests nobility and the brow suggests intelligence, Blumenbach thought. And so why shouldn't the people who are themselves the closest to the Ur type of humanity, obviously white Europeans, the purveyors of civilization, the people who had created the greatest art, the greatest literature, and were creating the greatest science in Blumenbach's day, people who were obviously more fit, better, smarter, more talented than any other population in the world, they must be closer to that original ideal created by God. They must be Caucasians. The use of that word then is, over the course of the rest of the 18th and 19th centuries, cemented because it does everything that Europeans um, want it to do. It gives an origin story to where this great race of human beings came from, somewhere maybe vaguely in the South Caucasus. It confirmed the idea that white people were favored by God. They were the primary type of people created by God from which others had devolved uh, over time, becoming Mongolians, Malays, Ethiopians, and Americans less perfect versions uh, of what were originally white people. Now, over the course of the 19th century, there is no lack of debate about what Blumenbach and his successors have to say. 
In fact, by the time Charles Darwin comes onto the scene, there is a host of different accounts of not only where races come from, but how many races there actually are. This is an age of further overseas exploration. The Industrial Revolution allows people to travel in ways that they've never traveled before. It allows Europeans to come in contact with people around the world in ways that they've never before been in contact with them. And if you have a look at Descent of Man, 1871, one of Charles Darwin's great treatises uh, on human beings as a component of the natural world, that old issue that Linnaeus um, more than a century earlier was getting at, you see that Darwin, um, who had a very good sense of humor, by the way, he's a terrific nonfiction prose writer, he begins to poke fun at how many versions of race there are in the world. But the most weighty of all the arguments against treating the races of man as distinct species, he says, Linnaeus, is that they graduate into each other, independently in many cases, as far as we can judge of their having intercrossed, meaning having interbred. Man has been studied more carefully than any other organic being, and yet there is the greatest possible diversity amongst capable judges, whether he should be classed as a single species or race, or two, or three, or four, or five, there he cites Blumenbach, six, seven, eight, 11, 15, 16, 22, 60, 63. It is hardly possible to discover clear distinctive character between them. Darwin is saying that First of all, those categories that Linnaeus and Blumenbach seem to present as having big high walls around them, once you start looking at examples of people in each of those categories, what do you find is a continuum, not hard and fast boundaries between physical types. And secondly, if the great scientists of the day can't even agree on how many races there are, well, is race a natural thing at all. Darwin at this stage, even though we look back on him and think of him as both a brilliant and courageous voice, not only in creating a theory of natural change that we now think of as the best available account of how the world as we find it got to be the way it is, Darwin did, had not won the day yet. Um, not only in terms of understanding how non-human species change, but in understanding human beings and their many varieties. In, in fact, in the middle of the 19th century, Darwin had very much lost the debate about race. One of the people who might say won it, um, at least for a time, and for, perhaps for at least a century and a half forward, is um, a French theorist named Arthur de Gobineau. Gobineau believed what his eyes and ears told him about human difference. He, going back to Linnaeus and back to Blumenbach, was convinced that things tended to cluster in the world of human difference, that artistic ability, language, clothing, um, emotional orientation, fitness for governance, all of these things seemed to go together. And at the top of the pile, were the people who in the 19th century were the ones who seemed to be inventing things, who seemed to be um, stoking the fires of industry, who seemed to be conquering the world. And that is people like him. Gobineau published a rather famous essay in the 1850s called An Essay on the Inequality of Human Races, in which he says very clearly, the following, the white race originally possessed a monopoly on beauty, on intelligence, and on power. Think, by the way, of the devolutionist idea of Blumenbach. History shows that the entirety of civilization flows from the white race. I mean, look around, Gobineau says, that nothing would exist without the contribution of this race, and that a society is only as great or brilliant as the proportion it conserves of the noble group that created it. 
Gobineau is given, giving not only a historical and contemporary gloss to what Linnaeus and Blumenbach and others had been saying all along, but he's giving you some very clear policy recommendations here. Your greatness, Europeans, white people, will last only so long as you begin to understand the natural inequality of these racial types that we've been identifying for more than a century. You need to keep out the lesser ones, promote the better ones, and to the degree possible, prevent the admixing of lesser and greater types. The stakes are really high. Civilization, in a way, depends on it. I want to open a little parentheses here for a moment and think about the way these ideas have filtered into uh, our own country, the United States, from the very beginning. From the outset, the United States, a country founded on both Enlightenment ideas that I've been talking about, as well as the institution of enslavement that placed white people and black people, those Blumenbachian, Caucasians, and Ethiopians on the same piece of territory because of the transatlantic slave trade and in a deeply unequal set of power relationships because of the institution of the ownership of human beings by, by others. American policymakers from the very beginning were deeply interested in categorizing the people who happened to live together on this piece of land. Here's a page from the first US census ever conducted in 1790. The interesting thing about this first census is that from the very beginning, the United States is interested in categorizing people as to race or as it was called at the time, color. The columns on the manuscript version of this census are labeled head of household, free white males over 16, free white males under 16. And of course, 16 is important because you kind of want to know um, uh, the men of working age or even more importantly, the men of potential fighting age, free white females, all other free persons and slaves. The slave category doesn't have a color attached to it because by 1790, it was very clear that the only people who would be in that category were those who fit the Blumenbachian category of Ethiopian or Black. Those categories remain in place in one form or another throughout the history of the United States. We ask about them even today. We ask about them on the 2020 census. You were asked if you completed the census form to declare a racial category, um, which is uh, today among most free countries, a rather odd thing to do, but we've been asking about it in one form or another from 1790. But the categories change over time. So here's a US federal census page from 1860 from Knox County, Kentucky. And I've chosen this one for a very simple reason because it's the one on which my great grandfather appears and the first one on which, sorry, the first one on which my great grand, great, great grandfather appears and the first one on which my great grandfather appears. There they are, William King um, and his son, William King. Uh, the, the King family was really not very creative with the naming of its uh, men, apparently. They're here, and I've just chosen this one because it's kind of interesting that that's where my um, great grandfather first appears as a 16 year old um, man here. But notice this column. This column lists the racial category to which the individual has been assigned. And now we have, instead of just white or slave, we have white, black, or mulatto, a term that at the time meant someone who was of immediate mixed parentage between a white person and a, and a black person. If you look carefully at this page, you may notice something else. And that is that the handwriting on the page is exactly the same. One person filled out a census form. Um, you would, as a census enumerator, go and ask people, 
Um, you know, how many children do you have in your household? Who's the head of the household? What are their ages? And then you would assign them to a racial category because it would, by the 1860s, would have been completely obvious uh, to which category you belonged, white, black, mulatto. In fact, it wasn't until the second half of the 20th century that you got to choose yourself which race you were assigned to on US censuses. And it was only in 2010, 2010, that you were allowed to pick more than one. So where have we got to at this stage? We've got from Enlightenment science to the South Caucasus, to the creation of racial categories and the cementing of this idea of white people and Caucasians, to a US census system seemingly obsessed with the idea of categorizing people according to race. What happens over the rest of the 19th century is perhaps surprising and in its way, darkly magnificent. And it's this, that at the very time people are traveling around the world, discovering exotic cultures, building empires, creating more and more sophisticated ways of understanding those people who are labeled Ethiopian, Malay, American, and so on by Blumenbach. Caucasians are also becoming, beginning to think of themselves, that is white people are beginning to think of themselves as having their own unique, interesting, and even exotic, maybe even erotic history. At exactly the same time as Americans are building in their own country these racial categories, in European art, literature, travel writing, people are also rediscovering the Caucasus. Um, it's a time, of course, um, of rebellions against the Russian Empire, um, takes up the first half of the 19th century. Uh, British um, empire builders are finding ways of stoking conflict between local Caucasus populations, particularly in the Caucasus Highlands and in the, uh, against um, the, uh, the Russian Empire. It's the time of the Great Game when British and Russian forces are vying for influence all across Eurasia. And Europeans begin to discover their own deep ancestors in new and interesting ways you begin to find representations of particularly women from the Caucasus appearing in British magazines, appearing in British art, great Orientalist painters of the 19th century begin to depict an odalisque, a woman lying suggestively uh, on a bed um, in an Ottoman harem perhaps, always a white woman of, of course. There is great concern with slavery and the horrible institution of slavery, not as it's practiced in the United States, but as it's believed to be practiced in the Ottoman Empire, where white women from the Caucasus um, might be taken into the Ottoman imperial household and made to live out their lives as servants of a Muslim, a Muslim um, monarch. Here's a, an image of a so-called Circassian and Georgian lady uh, from the early 19th century. Um, the line between geographic description, traveler's tales, art, and eroticism, the lines are very, very shady as the 19th century um, progresses. All of these ideas come together in a perhaps surprising place back in the United States under the aegis of the great American showman P.T. Barnum. Barnum, at exactly the time that Caucasus uplanders are fighting against the Russian Empire, at exactly the time that people are becoming more and more interested in the history of white people and their um, alleged enslavement um, in this dastardly Muslim empire of the East among the Ottomans, Barnum realizes that there is perhaps some money to be made off of these ideas. And in, in, um, in 1860, he starts a museum in New York um, that um, eventually is called Barnum's uh, Museum and predates uh, the Barnum Circus that eventually becomes the um, Ring, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey uh, Circus. 
And in this museum, you would uh, pay um, a small entry fee and arrayed before you would be the great wonders of the world. Um, you might see um, strange animals, you know, a two-headed calf or a boa constrictor that had just been brought from uh, the jungles of South America. You might see the great oddities of human life. You might see um, the largest ball of twine you've ever seen or, the lar or a representation of the largest diamond that had ever been exhibited. And then at some point you might go into a room and see this person, Zoberdia Luti. Zoberdia Luti was a Circassian beauty. And if you were able to talk with one of your great, great grandparents, um, if I were able to talk with my great, great grandfather, William King on that census in the middle of the 19th century, he would have known the term Circassian beauty. The Circassians of course are a local, large local population in the Northwest Caucasus. They were at the core of the Highland um, rebellion against the Russian Empire in the 19th century, succumbing only in 1864 with a massive exodus of Circassians to the, the Ottoman Empire that Circassian activists today uh, call a genocide. But Zoberdi Luti was there for you to see you know, in the flesh. She might talk with you miraculously in English about what her life in the Caucasus was like, about how she had been rescued by a Christian missionary from the Ottoman harem, uh, brought to the United States, and uh, now being allowed to, to be on display and make some money, uh, uh, talking to you in English, miraculously, um, in New York. And you can see that she is dressed here in a kind of exoticizing, and it has to be said, eroticizing um, outfit with the fringe and this sort of great, vaguely a Greek um, pattern drape um, uh, with an urn and a, a rope for some reason coming out of the urn. Uh, her wild hair suggested that there was something different about her. She was an ur type of white person. And how thrilling this must have been, not only to see a beautiful individual, but someone who represented the ur type of your own race, if you happen to be a white person. There you could see a Blumenbachian Caucasian right before your eyes. Now, of course, Zoberde Luti wasn't really named Zoberde Luti. We don't know her real name, but she was probably an Irish girl from the Lower East Side who had been roped into uh, serving as a Circassian beauty by that great showman, P.T. Barnum. In fact, there were, they were so popular, Circassian beauties, in the middle and end of the 19th century that no dime museum, as these things were called, was um, complete without one. No circus sideshow was complete without one. And because the um, museum, Barnum's Museum, happened to be not far from some of the great photographic studios in New York, we have many, 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 many examples of pictures of these women, actual photographs of these women from the time. Caucasians showing other Caucasians what it was like to be racially pure. Well, Barnum wasn't the only person who got into this business of bringing people or allegedly bringing people from the Caucasus to charm American audiences. If you were to go at the very beginning of the 20th century to a performance of Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, you would see not only trick riding by um, Native Americans from the Western Plains, you would also see trick riders from Guria in the Georgian West, um, men who clearly are dressed in Caucasus attire here with a sword and a kinjal, that, that short dagger, dressed in a long cloak or cherkeska with the cartridge panels on, uh, on the front. And this was um, very much part of a Wild West entertainment 
show um, as late as the first decade of the 20th century. Weirdly enough, Americans were probably more familiar with things called Caucasians in a geographic sense, Georgians, Gurians, Circassians, um, at the beginning of the 20th century than they were at the end of the 20th century or beginning of the 21st century, because they could see them in popular culture. There's a dark side to this story, obviously. We've been talking about categorization and um, Circassian beauties. But this is exactly the time, a decade or so after Buffalo Bill's Wild West show ends, that questions of race in American politics and public life come to the fore as never before. The Jim Crow laws that had been put in place after the end of the Civil War, after the end of Reconstruction, um, are fully cemented, not just in the Old South, but across the United States. The Ku Klux Klan as a national organization, not one just restricted to the South, but a truly national organization has taken root. Here's a photograph from 1926 of a Klan march down Pennsylvania Avenue uh, with the capital of the United States just in the background. This was also a moment when people were interested as never before in those old questions that Linnaeus and Blumenbach had speculated about, but now with the entire armory of modern science at their disposal. We think of eugenics as being something that was associated with the Third Reich, the idea of using a dark version of science to determine who is fitter and less fit uh, that reached its apotheosis during um, the, the time of Hitler and Nazi Germany. But of course, the Germans didn't invent eugenics as a science. Uh, if you went to any um, fair in the United States um, in the first few decades of the 20th century, you might be able to go into a eugenics building where you could see what science was telling us about human reproduction, about the way to create a fitter family, um, about the way in which the, uh, the new science of genetics, the word gene was only, was less than about 30 years old at this stage. What genetics was now telling us about the right way to build not just a family, but the right way to build an entire society. Because if you look at the word itself, eugenics, it simply is a contraction of two Greek words, meaning to be well born. It was the ultimate initial human right, in a way, that if you could figure out a way to make human beings fitter and better from the very beginning, to prevent bad kinds of human beings from being born, wouldn't you be instantiating an ultimate kind of human right by not allowing that person even to exist. You could enter your family in a fitter families contest uh, where uh, the height and weight and nutrition and teeth, hair color of your family would be assessed by a competent group of judges at exactly the same time as judges in another building in a state fair might be reviewing the Holsteins and the pigs uh, to determine which type of cow um, or other animal was fittest and best bred. You might also note that, of course, all the, photo, all the people in these photos are white because the idea that someone who wasn't white, who wasn't in that Blumenbachian Caucasian category could be fit at all was simply unthinkable. If you wanted to go over to the, one of those buildings housing animals, you would also be given a whole set of uh, lessons about the way in which the interbreeding of these different types produce less fit, less good types of human beings, about the way in which crossing those categories that Blumenbach had created, created people who were less good than the pure types that we know create empires, make science, do really good art. Here you see 
uh, from 1926, um, just a display of guinea pigs, a pure white or a pure black one. What happens when the white and the black are mixed as hybrids and the, the strange versions uh, that you get when these naturally occurring types unnaturally mix. You could even at the same time find plenty of people who believed that these ideas were not only scientifically true, but ought to inform how the United States did everything from public policy to immigration law. In fact, at Georgetown in 1921, if you wanted to join an organization that was committed to the purity of the American racial type, um, you could even be featured in the Georgetown yearbook. Here is the Georgetown Ku Klux Klan Club of 1921. The point of this is not just to think of how shocking it is to see something like this in 2021, but to try to convince you that none of these ideas were fringe. This was the scientific establishment. It was the political establishment. It was the way in which people thought of science, of politics, of the natural state of the world, and of what a good patriotic American ought to believe. The United States by the 1920s had created a system of racial segregation, of racial definition, of racial ordering that was literally second to none. Uh, there was no country in the world that had forcibly sterilized more women than the United States by the early 1930s. Uh, along the lines of that you would have been instructed on in the eugenics building. Um, no country in the world held more people of a racial minority in confinement or forced them into uh, forced labor uh, than the United States. No country in the world had a more elaborate census taking mechanism to define people by race and then to teach school children that the things that had just been measured on the census were not a matter of politics or history, but a matter of nature and science. So that when you come to the 1930s, it only makes sense for another society that's deeply interested in these things, Germany, to begin studying the American example. And not to put too fine a point on it, but we might call what the Germans were doing in their study of the United States in the early 1930s, the original area studies program. If you were going to build a racially ordered polity in Germany, if you were going to eliminate the inferior, if you were going to separate out those populations that were doing damage to the patria, you would surely want to study how a country had gotten all of that about as right as you can imagine. And so here's a page from a Nazi journal from 1936 entitled The Rise of the Race Question that gives you a very clear sense of legal restrictions of black race law, as it says in, in German, across the United States. Places where there is no freedom, where mixing with white people is forbidden, where there is Rassentrennung, where there is segregation, versus those where people are merely um, prevented from marrying across racial lines, uh, which as you can see, the sort of striped lines on the map were not just in the old South. By the 1930s, most states in the United States had legal restrictions on marriage across racial lines. And if you think that's ancient history, reflect on the fact for a moment that I was born, and I'm not that old, I was born in the year that it finally became fully legal in the United States for black people and white people to marry. The echoes of this are with us even today. So the, by the time we get to 1935 and the Nuremberg race laws in Germany, the infamous laws that defined what it meant to be Deutsch Blutiger or of German blood, what it meant to be a Mischling of the first grade or of the second grade, what it meant to be a Jew, that defined the inability of Jews to hold positions in universities, to 
own businesses, uh, to marry um, uh, across the lines of Jewish and non-Jewish. By the time we get to 1935, there is a long trail of law, of court cases, and even of displays at state fairs that are showing exactly how this is supposed to work. We can see the vestiges of all of this, the role of categories, the great monuments we build in this country to our own racial past, about six blocks from where I'm sitting now here on Capitol Hill. This is the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress. If you walk around the exterior of the library, a building that was opened in the 1890s, you see a visual representation of exactly the categories and the hierarchies I've been talking of. The keystones on the building represent the major racial types of humanity. There are actually 33 heads, types and subtypes all around the building. And from everything I've set up now, it won't surprise you to know that the people who are on the front of the building looking out at the Capitol are white, the people as they begin to wrap around the sides are in those Blumenbachian categories of American and Malay um, and Mongolian. And on the back of the building, over the back doors of the building facing away from the Capitol are people that we would describe as African, Melanesian, the categories that uh, Blumenbach knew as uh, Ethiopian and, and others. We were so sure of these things that we literally carved them in stone on our greatest institution of human knowledge. But you don't need to believe me on any of this. You can listen to what the person who created the most grotesque and horrific system of expressing these ideas and their logical conclusions, um, Adolf Hitler himself, who in Mein Kampf says there is currently one state in which one can observe at least the weak beginnings of a better conception of racial order, the United States, Hitler says. Most countries in the world don't understand how you preserve racial integrity, how you keep out the undesirable, what you do to people who make the bad decision of mixing greater and lesser types. Most countries don't understand that, Hitler says. The only one who gets it kind of right is the United States. So we've come from Enlightenment era science through to this unnamed, unknown woman, Femina Georgiana, and Blumenbach's inf infatuation with her, to the pushback in the 19th century by Darwin, to the marrying of public policy and race theory by Gobineau and others, to the creation of an institutional structure of racial categorization and hierarchy in the United States, to the modeling of that for Nazi Germany. There is one story here, and it's one that if you're alive in 2021, you can't believe is finished. We in the United States carry a long trail of race making, racial identification, hierarchy building along behind us. And it has a Eurasian component to it as this young woman illustrates. The final thing I'll say about these ideas is that Remarkably, in the summer of 2021, the story I just told you for the last hour, longer than I meant to talk, could be considered illegal in the states of Arkansas, Idaho, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, and Iowa, all of which have passed laws against the idea of what's called critical race theory which I'm not, I'm not even sure what that really is meant to mean, but they've passed laws against trying to understand the connectedness of these stories as I've just tried to lay them out to you. And if there's anything that ought to convince you 
that these stories aren't finished. It's that basic fact. I've spoken for too long and I'll stop there, but thanks very much for, uh, for coming. I'm happy if we have time to, to engage you in conversation. Sure, Charles, that was fascinating. Um, I think we do have time if people still want to stay um, on, on the Zoom. Um, I think the best thing if you have a question or a comment is uh, to go to the reaction and uh, I'll illustrate that for you now. And that is to um, put your hand up like that. I'm, I'm gonna ask you a brief question, Charles. I'd like you to tell us how they are going to make this into a film. <laughs> oh, so, so yes. So I should say, um, I would love if um, people took my Margaret Mead and, and Boaz and whatever book and, and made something of it. Um, there was a little bit of interest in that to, to begin with, but nothing, nothing um, sad. But the but Midnight of the Pair Palace, the other book, my book about Istanbul, ah. is a Netflix series that will be out um, next year. Um, it, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, in, in Turkish and English and Russian, I, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I will tell you though, um, virtually the only thing that comes from my book is the title. <laughs> okay. So um, it is, uh, and I'm not joking, it is a time travel drama uh, mm -hmm. that um, I am hoping is going to be like the Turkish outlander. I had nothing to do with any of this. Like a Turkish outlander that um, takes you back to 1919 jazz age Istanbul. And uh, uh. Um, adventures ensue, let's put it that way. <laughs> um, Olga Mirsen has several things in the chat. Would you like to say yeah, something? Uh, hey, Olga, how are you? Um, let's see. She says, how, what uh, Linnaeus classified classical nudity racially, I mean. The first thing is kind of just an observation, but there were a couple of questions. Yeah, go, go ahead. Why don't you just tell, tell me what they are, and then, then I can respond. Uh, well, uh, there seem to be many things all across Europe way before people like Hitler. Like, uh, I was wondering about some connections or roots of the Barnum types in the, uh, uh, say, Peter's Kunstkamera. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, whether they would be aware of it or it would be just a parallel development. Yeah, no, so you're, you're absolutely right. So. Um... You know, from even beginning in the Renaissance, of course, people are putting together collections of of of, of oddities. You know, uh, cameras of, of oddities or strange things that, um, you know, just to delight um, a, a, a your friends or a noble or aristocratic audience. What is different about Barnum is that he takes that basic idea of just you know, putting a bunch of weird stuff in in a room, and makes it open to the public, makes it open to the paying public. He also, I think, um, has a particular, you know, he doesn't claim to be a scientist. He doesn't claim to be demonstrating any scientific realities in his museum. It is a, a form of entertainment. But this is exactly at the same time, the middle of the 19th century, that in Germany, um, a little bit later in the United States, or what will become Germany, a little bit later in the United States and France, people are beginning to create scientific museums. Um, where you're trying to show proper categorizations of things. We call them, you know, museums of natural history or of ethnography or eventually anthropology. What's fascinating, though, about the, the convergence of Barnum and we might say the serious museums of the age is that they're really telling a very similar story. You know, the story is about um, change leading to how Europeans got to be so wonderful, for lack of a lack of a better word, that there's a linear story that is told. You know, that goes from the first room of a serious museum to the last room of a serious museum, and that only begins to change much later in the 20th century. I mean, think about today. If you go to the Museum of Natural History in New York, it's only now that people have decided to take down that statue of Teddy Roosevelt. Right, that has an African man and a Native American man on foot alongside Roosevelt on his horse. Um, and it's still the case that displays on so-called primitive societies are housed in the same building 
with the diorama of elk and bison and so on. And then you have to go across Central Park to the Metropolitan Museum to see real culture, right? To see real civilization. And that is, you know, the modern end of exactly this same kind of story. So, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. All of these things are, are connected in exactly that way. Another, another uh, thing, it's half question, half observation uh, about uh, the eugenic society charts. They resemble uh, almost in an eerie way what you have with the uh, uh, charts of uh, recessive versus dominant genes in various combinations, what, what becomes the phenotype as opposed to the genotype, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember that around 1990, I actually attended a lecture by Boris Gasparov at Columbia, mm -hmm. where he talked about the dangers of uh, determinism in Soviet genetics. Yeah. That's precisely, you know, uh, in other words, we know about possible differences between the two, but he actually said that, oddly enough, if you detach yourself from ideology, Lysenko leaves us a little bit more freedom yeah. about anthropology than Soviet genetics. It was a rather paradoxical thesis, but the similarity, was, I just found it very striking right now. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, because, you know, by the 1920s and 30s, people begin to understand something about um, a thing that has, you know, for only about 30 years been labeled a gene, but people knew from the 19th century, um, um, even in different ways from the 18th century about how different com combinations of types worked and, you know, what, what, would, what would be produced um, as in, in particular combinations, the kind of outcomes you would get because of breeding and, you know, dominant recessive genes, as you say. But what people also in the eugenic society and the global eugenics movement in which the United States was a leader, and by the way, the three international congresses of eugenicists that took place before the, before the Second World War, two of them took place in, in the United States. They were hosted by the American Museum of, of, of Natural History in New York. People also believed that you could um, categorize all sorts of things about human beings along those same combinatorial lines, not just eye color, say, or what color a, a guinea pig would turn out uh, to be, but things like intelligence or fitness or um, uh, creativity, you know, that all of these things, I mean, after all, if, um, if a, a, the, the fur of a guinea pig operates according to certain discernible laws, well, shouldn't creativity, intelligence, and fitness also operate according to those same laws? And that's what the eugenics movement was, was trying to get at. Yeah, exactly. I think Michael, oh, sorry, I think Michael David Fox had a question. Yeah. Thank you, Charles, for such an interesting talk. Uh, I wanna second the idea that gods of the upper air would make for a great film. <laughs> um, I hope you um, sell the rights to that soon. Um, I was thinking about how, you know, you talk mostly about the US and Germany and the Caucasus comes in as the object of, you know, the British and other European fascination. Yeah. I was thinking what it might do to include the Russian empire and yeah. the Soviet Union, not that you had, didn't have enough, <laughs> ground to cover there. But in particular, um, I was interested in how aware they were in the Russian Empire of the craze about the Caucasians and the Circassians. From what I know about the history of Russian ethnography, right? They, they um, Russian ethnography, first of all, Gobineau, Count Gobineau wasn't received very well in Russia, but scientific racism in general didn't get much traction. And the explanation I've read by historians of ethnography is that you know, so many of these ethnographers were from a multicultural background. They were either Baltic Germans who were Russified. They realized that culture was more malleable and that you know, they had themselves been assimilated. Yeah. So that's, and then of course the weaker uh, state of nationalism in general. So, um, 
you know, I was just wondering of those two things, you know, what it would to include the different trajectory of sort of Russian thinking about race, but also interested in how uh, that whole perception of the Caucasus from Europe was received. Yeah, well, you know, you you would know so much more about, uh, I think, some of these things than than I would. Um, but the, you know, there is there has been debate, um, as you know, about whether there is a Russian concept of race, and how that developed historically, or a th would is there a thing that we might call race? Um, in, in a Russian historical context. Um, and I think you don't have to go into the origins of scientific theory to understand why Russia developed rather differently along these lines. And then the Soviet Union um, inherited that rather different path. I mean, the places that developed concepts of race as we understand it today were ones that first of all had overseas, had overseas empires. Um, and in which those overseas empires not only put them in contact with people who seem to be quite different from them. Lots of places have people who are different from other, other people. There's nothing new about that. But in which the form of contact was immediately hierarchical. Right? So um, the experience of having a slave system and a slave-oriented empire with a, if I can be Marxist for a moment, a slave mode of production um, was the driver of the science and not the other way around. You know? So the science was the thing that served the existence of power, economic, political hierarchies. And so it's interesting, I think, in the Russian case that, uh, and let me just speculate for a moment, that the places where you get a thing that looks closer to racism are precisely the places where Russia had something that looked more like an overseas empire, and I mean in Central Asia. So that it, it and it, so it's 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 not um, it's no coincidence that so many. Um, historians, uh, local activists, and others in a Central Asian context today find something in post-colonialism as a set of theories for understanding their own historical experience that in, you know, an Armenian or Georgian case don't seem to work exactly as well. Um, but I think that's what I'd say. Ken, do you have a question? We can't hear you, unfortunately. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, I think I'm unmuted now. Yep, Charles, uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, not unexpected at all from you. Terrific. What I wanted to ask is uh, all the theorists and uh, scientists and uh, people you've, uh, anthropologists that you've talked about are, you know, European or American. Uh, what I wanted to know is uh, China's an ancient society, Japan as well. Uh, were there similar evolutions of thought about they being, uh, you know, superior to the Caucasians? Uh, how did that all fit together? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a fascinating question. And and I'm afraid I don't have the expertise to answer it with, with all the depth that it, it deserves. Um, so the, A, you, human universal is um, the fact that societies seem to think of themselves as superior to other societies when they encounter groups that are essentially unlike, um, unlike them. And never, so far as I can tell, as Franz Boas would say, in every society of which we have knowledge, this happens. Um, but, but so far as I can tell, never with any real justification or with any actually objective justification. Um, and that is true, I think, of how China has viewed the rest of the world, how China has viewed its neighbors, systems of colonial domination that were put in place by Japan during the Second World War. You know, the, the, list, of, the list goes on and on. And with creations of systems that we might describe as racialized systems. 
And by that, I simply mean where a parent physical difference is used as a differentiator and determinant of power hierarchies in a given society. But what I think is different about the European case and the European and then um, American case and why it's worth spending some time on, on, on this in particular is that no societies in the 19th and 20th centuries so fully applied the tools of modern science to the elaboration and, and policing of these categories as those societies did. So there are plenty of ways in which you police boundaries, and those are interesting kind of comparisons. For example, Isabel Wilkerson's last book, Cast, you know, is all about taking a, 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 an Indian subcontinent idea of how, um, how inheritable caste works and then applying that to the United States and seeing if that gives you a little more purchase on the history of race in the United States, sort of putting the race idea to the side for one moment and looking at another society that is deeply hierarchically organized and also polices the boundaries of identity, if you want to call it that, around each of those categories. What it was different about race is the um, mobilization of an account of nature, an account of science to justify it, right? And in the 19th and 20th centuries, that was the most powerful language available to you. Right? There was nothing more powerful than the idea of science. There was no divine right of kings anymore. There was no you know, what God wants anymore. There was science with a capital S. And race is at the absolute center of how the human sciences develop in a, in a European context. Great, thank you. Thanks. Um, Bradley, I think you have a question and I think that probably has to be the last one, please. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Charles, for this, this great sure. talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about how this intersects with, with Gods of the Upper Air. Um, specifically, uh, I was interested in the, the Barnum Museum, which comes before uh, the Chicago World's Fair and the ethnographic exhibit there uh, and seems to share uh, some, some genetic makeup. Um, and also I noticed that you jumped from there to Buffalo Bill uh, who actually set up shop outside of the gates of the Chicago World's Fair um, as, as well. Um, and so I just wanted to know how this sort of entertainment aspect that you seem to be highlighting here intersects with the more um, scientific uh, anthropological aspect that you highlight in the book and whether that sort of entertainment aspect had something to do with Boaz's rejection of the fair and, and sort of storming off in a huff uh, yeah, that, that yes. he did there. Right. So. Um... You know, museum creators are always are, are in the business of entertainment as well as instruction. You know, even the most serious um, museumologists also realize that they're at least in part in the entertainment business. For Barnum, you know, it was all entertainment. It was a it was a stationary circus sideshow. That's essentially and, and Barnum. You know, um, he made he had no qualms about lying about what you were seeing or, you know, doing anything to sensationalize and entertain a, um, a, a potential audience. Um, and that was true even at the Chicago World's Fair. It was even true in early ethnographic museums um, in, in the United States. The thing that a person like Franz Boas, founder of American Anthropology, one of the people at the core of my, my, my last book, Gods of the Upper Air, the thing he objected to was not so much the entertainment side of things. He was a realist. He understood so that you got to get people through the door if you're going to have a museum. What he objected to was the structure of the story that you told once you got inside the museum. You know, because in museums of the day, and this is true of the Smithsonian, um, in its early incarnations here in the United States, things were grouped according to their level of civilization. Because the idea was that all societies pass through the same savage, barbarian, civilized stages. You know, people in Papua New Guinea are savage. Um, people in um, uh, South Asia are merely barbarian. People in Europe are fully civilized. And over time, you know, people can be expected to move across these categories 
based on whether they have enough Christian missionaries on hand and electricity and flush toilets and, and so forth. Um, but if you went into a museum, you would see exactly that progress. And so you would take, you know, bone rattles or bows and arrow or arrows or drums, and you would group them from vastly different societies as we would now recognize them to be, all in the same kind of place, because you're showing what that level of civilization can produce. And then by the time you get to the end of the museum or you have to go across to the Met, then you see, you know, when people have finally realized that the only real art is oil paint on canvas, you know, that's what civilized people produce. Then you go to another proper museum, art museum and see that kind of thing. And Boaz said, this is nonsense. It's absolute nonsense because there's no reason to believe that this painting on a piece of birch bark using berry juice is any more civilized than using ground oil paint on coated canvas. I mean, what's your theory that tells you one is more civilized or expressive or sophisticated than the other? And so Boaz is the one who finally gets us to start organizing things according to what anthropologists would later call culture areas. That, by the way, is the thing that gives birth to the entire concept of area studies that you know that language history culture music art coalesce in a way and that if you really want to understand people in a geographic location you need to come at it from all those different angles thank you so much charles we could go on for another two hours you've been very <laughs> generous with your time i think we all understand why you're a prize-winning <laughs> prolific author uh, this was really fascinating and um uh, you know, good luck with your next projects. And as I say, a number of us hope that they will make this into a movie.